For those of you watching this program online, imagine what an internet blackout would mean to you. Shut out of messaging sites, forced off social media, deprived of news, information, and the means to contact loved ones. Imagine you're Kashmiri, and the Indian government has left you in the dark for four months now. Or you're Iranian, and you've just experienced your most serious internet shutdown ever. Both of those shutdowns were imposed by governments, which said they were trying to prevent security threats. Their critics, human rights workers among them, say this is about silencing dissent, deliberately severing connections between people, a form of collective punishment. In fact, blackouts are now a standard feature in the authoritarian Internet playbook, an increasingly common response by governments that fear their grip on power is slipping. Flip a switch or two, and it's lights out for freedom of information and freedom of expression. Our starting point this week is the Indian-administered, blacked-out region of Kashmir. Two cities, two countries, two populations, large parts of which are politically restless, and two governments with the means to silence them. Srinagar, Kashmir, offline for four months now and counting after the Modi government in New Delhi altered the constitution to revoke the region's autonomy, and the Iranian capital, Tehran, where net users were recently forced offline in the longest shutdown ever after economic protesters had taken to the streets. The authorities in Delhi and Tehran both had stories to control and used blackouts to do it, keeping their citizens in the dark, stopping them from speaking to the outside world. These are two very extended internet shutdowns that happen around a political crisis in the country. In the case of Iran, of course, this was around uh, economic protests that really uh, snowballed into large-scale anti-government protests. And in Kashmir, there have been protests and riots that have been happening in that sort of disputed territory for a while. What's marked these two shutdowns was just how long that they have lasted and sort of the, the humanitarian and economic costs that they have rotted on the, on the population. These internet shutdowns are also different from each other. Iran did block the internet entirely, but it did so for a relatively short period of time and was responsive to international pressure. Whereas in Kashmir, we're seeing a, an ongoing internet shutdown that's quite unique because of the fact that the vast majority of Indian internet users access the internet through mobile technologies. Between January and July of 2019, there were 128 internet shutdowns, uh, a large chunk of which occurred in India. Srinagar is the unofficial internet shutdown capital of the world. According to a Delhi-based nonprofit, the Software Freedom Law Center, this year alone, Narendra Modi's government has cut off mobile and internet services there 55 times. This latest blackout has lasted so long, Kashmiris have become unintended casualties of WhatsApp systems. Any account that has been inactive for 120 days is automatically deactivated by the company. And it doesn't stop there. What has been unprecedented is the, is the scale of it. We've seen that during this shutdown that even one-way communication, such as cable TV, was being, uh, was being shut. I mean, these are measures that were not even taken during the war. So it's quite unprecedented. And it's impacted different groups very severely, uh, from students trying to access uh, examination material online, from um, pharmacies trying to stock up on medicines, from women trying to access justice mechanisms online, legal advice is given online. So, an array of activities have been affected from education to medicine to just communication between family members. Iran has shut down internet access far less often than India has. But when it does, the blackouts are comprehensive. During protests in 2017 and 18, it blocked mobile networks and access to messaging apps. The UN called the blackouts a serious violation of fundamental rights. When hikes in petrol prices led to new demonstrations last month and a security response in which more than 130 protesters have been killed, Iranians would have known what was coming. 
Within 24 hours, connectivity levels, which are usually at around 65% in Iran, fell to just 5%. That is how long it took the authorities to issue their orders to the various ISPs, Internet Service Providers. It wasn't a kill switch, it didn't happen immediately. This was basically coordination across all the internet service providers in Iran and getting them to turn them off. I was actually privy to some uh, leaked documents and you could see how the government had ordered these internet service providers to go through a methodological plan of actually bringing the country back online to the international internet and they were telling them who to connect back online and these were you know the startups, um, public institutions, the research uh, institutes and then onto you know the broader public. Forcing ISPs to take orders is one way to control the internet but it's complicated. Building your own national intranet by limiting the number of information pipelines into and out of a country is another. China and North Korea both have national intranets, easily policed, and Iran is developing a model along the same lines. Intranets allow a government to unilaterally cut off its citizens from content the rest of the world sees. Intranets also spawn all kinds of mirror platforms, modeled on the likes of Facebook, YouTube, and WhatsApp, domestic versions of software or apps that those governments can control far more easily than the ones based in Silicon Valley. What China offers to the world is right now a model of the internet where uh, it can be more state-centric. In fact, Chinese officials are inviting experts from different countries to China in order to better understand China's model of having a national internet. And what we're starting to see is in places like Russia, rather than sort of using the universal uh, internet infrastructure, they're creating their own infrastructure with a different set of protocols and sort of web addresses um, in order to, in some ways, secede from the global internet. When we see the internet sort of being broken up into many different internets, um, I think that the, the result for democracy and freedom isn't good. The idea for the National Information Network was conceived all the way back as early as 2005 in Iran. One of the nicknames that it got was Halalnet, and this was, you know, to describe how the immoral content that could be found on, you know, a free and open internet would naturally be censored, and there would be like a, a moral Islamic version of the internet. And it's really been intensified, however, under the Hassan Rouhani administration. We've also seen alternatives to platforms like YouTube, which are censored. So the Iranian version of YouTube is Aparat, and it's actually quite popular. On internet shutdowns, the position of the UN's Office for Human Rights is clear. They are a breach of basic human rights, freedom of expression, freedom of information that Kashmir is a form of collective punishment without even a pretext of a precipitating event, that Iranians have been deprived not only of a fundamental freedom, but also basic access to essential services. And one thing that governments might want to ask themselves before they go down this path, do internet shutdowns even work? There is zero evidence to prove that internet shutdowns are actually effective in quelling unrest or violence. In fact, what researchers from Stanford have found that when you implement these kind of uh, internet shutdowns, that it promotes violent action because violent sort of mobilization requires less coordination and effort in that sense than non-violent coordination. With the information vacuum, there is more misinformation that's being spread. So it honestly takes away from the cause more than it really contributes to effectuating any peace in the situation. I think in this day and age, given the ways in which the internet is utilized for everything from banking and economic services to personal communications and everything in between, um, we do have to consider access to the internet as a human right. We should not allow governments like Iran's to restrict access for its citizens. People need to be able to communicate, they need to be able to access services, and so, you know, shutting down the entire internet should absolutely be off limits.